We have finished with studying the theory of the consumer, and now we move to the second main part of this course, which is the theory of the firm. You'll recall that when we studied the theory of the consumer, we had one chapter where we just talked about preferences and the utility function. We didn't talk about prices at all. Prices came in the next chapter. Similarly here, we're first going to talk about the technology, the engineering that the firm has available to itself. We're not going to talk at all about prices until uh, later on. Prices are buying anything on the market. So we start here with the general notion of a production function. The, the right hand side is the production function. The idea is that input, the inputs to the production like X, Y, and Z are combined and once you know the inputs then you plug them into this functional form and you get the output Q. So Q is uh, Q is output. One question that may be asked is the question of joint production which is where you have more than one output the classic example is raising sheep gives both wool and mutton. So you have the same inputs producing two different outputs. Or another example might be an oil refinery where crude oil is used to make several different products. We're going to not analyze joint production in this class. We're going to assume that it doesn't exist because it's fairly complicated. So therefore our production function will have only one output. The usual example that I'm going to appeal to for a production function is the second line here. Q equals F of W and F. Uh, F is the, is the functional form where what I'm thinking of is using water and fertilizer to produce corn. So water is denoted by W, fertilizer is denoted by capital F, and corn is denoted by capital Q for quantity, not C. C would cause conflicts with words with terms involving the word cost, and it's traditional to use Q for output. One of the advantages of using this example is that just the units of measurement tell you what I'm talking about. So I will measure water in gallons, fertilizer in pounds, and corn in bushels. Abbreviation for gallons is GAL, abbreviation for pounds is LB or LBS, and abbreviation of bushels is BU. For those of you who are who are more familiar with the metric system, uh, water would be measured in liters rather than gallons, fertilizer in kilograms rather than pounds, and corn in liters rather than bushels. So bushels is a measure of volume, pounds is a measure of weight, and gallons is also a measure of volume. The next thing to say is we are assuming completeness in the same kind of way that we assumed in consumer theory. In other words, we're assuming that the firm knows all the possible ways that you could produce its output. The, so if you write the general production function f of x, y, z, and so forth, the firm knows for any value of x, any value of y, and any value of z, or any value of the vector x, y, z, whatever the numbers happen to be, if you plug those in, the firm knows how much output it would get. So there's no uncertainty about this. Now, it, it's, it would be rather easy to extend this to a simple kind of uncertainty. For example, uncertainty about the weather. So maybe you know there's a 5% chance of severe drought every year. Then the firm doesn't know for sure if it puts in a certain water and fertilizer how much corn it gonna, it's going to get. But it knows that in most, in let's say 95% of the years it's going to get a certain percentage of corn and the other 5% of 
of the years it's going to get a, a different uh, amount of corn. So that kind of incomplete knowledge doesn't cause a problem. In fact, it doesn't really violate completeness because we know the probabilities. What would violate completeness is having some kind of fundamental uncertainty about what would happen if you put in a certain amount of x, y, z, and so forth. We'll talk about that more as we go along. Some critical aspects are what I wish to discuss next. The first one is, is this, that the notion of a production function is like having a, a cookbook which has recipes, but the recipes only give a list of ingredients. They don't tell what to do with the ingredients. That is actually exactly what a production function is. It's a list of ingredients and doesn't tell you what to do with them. So there's something missing from the production function approach to production, which is knowledge about how to incorporate the inputs together, how to use the inputs in order to produce an output. That's implicit in the fact that there is a production function, but it is a weakness that it's not made explicit that the, the procedures are not made explicit. It's just assumed that everybody knows what they are, so you don't have to talk about them. Another difficulty is this next thing I write about. How do you model technological change? The typical way to do it in lots of intermediate micro textbooks is to model it as getting more output from the same inputs. For example, the production function might be written q equals f of x, y, and z times some function, let's say, g of time. And then as time goes on, uh, g is an increasing function of time. So as time increases, g increases, and therefore q increases even if x, y, and z were constant. So that's a common way of thinking that uh, technological ch uh, change, technological progress, increases the ability to produce stuff. But this is, I think, not very satisfactory. When you compare the, our production technology to the production function 500 years ago, we're not getting more output from the same inputs. People 500 years ago weren't stupid. It, it's not that we're just smarter than they are, and so we use exactly the same inputs that they have, and we get a whole much more stuff than they did. Instead, we're getting different kinds of outputs from different kinds of inputs. For example, they didn't have computers. If they had computers, they could do with computers what we do with computers. If they had all the other stuff that we had, they just didn't have the kind of inputs that we have. So I don't think modeling technological change should be done by assuming that it's more output from the same inputs, but rather it's, it's more like a, a production function which and actually I've written in here on this on the last line over here a production function which is not fully known so 500 years ago you knew how to use X Y and Z but you didn't know that there were lots of other possible inputs which if you knew the procedures you could use to get useful outputs and as time goes on these the the procedures, the methods, which as I said, the steps, which are ignored in the cookbook style of thinking about production, these steps have become known, and so we know now how to use lots of different inputs that we didn't even think were inputs in order to produce output. The next question is, and, and by the way, if you, if you then think about the production function as this, then this violates the completeness assumption. So the last main topic here is how would you deal with, uh, with um, managers, uh, entrepreneurs, innovators? Now it's tempting to deal with them just as input. You say that the production function is a function of different things, x, y, z, and let's say entrepreneurship. One of the problems with this is how to measure it. 
how would you measure entrepreneurship? I, ideally, these things should be as easy to measure as how many gallons of water or how many pounds of fertilizer you're using. But obviously, there are different kinds of entrepreneurs. You have somebody like Steve Jobs, who can, can uh, found a successful company like, like Apple. And, uh, and then you have ont other entrepreneurs who are much less successful. You can measure these in retrospect, sort of after the fact, but the purpose of a production function is to try to predict what would happen if you change things, so it's talking about the future. And how would you measure the quality of entrepreneurship of a particular person or group of people in the future? Even Steve Jobs, how would you know how uh, he, he would con whether he would continue to innovate in the future, and if so, whether those innovations would be successful in the marketplace? So the real qu problem here with measurement. Another way of thinking about how to how to model managers, entrepreneurs, and innovators is this this last point here. You model them as revealing more of an incompletely known production function. So we have a production function that's incompletely known, as as I wrote here. And perhaps it's the role of an entrepreneur to to reveal more of that production function. So b before this entrepreneur did his work, everybody just thought the production function was f of x, y, and z. After the entrepreneur works, he has shown everybody that x, y, z, and uh, let's call it a. Uh, that A is a new kind of input you can use, and if you use that input, then then you have a completely different set of possibilities. Mathematically, thinking about entrepreneurship in that way is a, a equivalent to changing the production function from an old production function to a new production function. Maybe the old production function actually had, uh, in other words, maybe the sort of production function in God's mind, if one wants to think about it that way, all wa always was X, Y, Z, and A. But before this entrepreneur did his work, A was identically equal to zero, and so nobody knew anything about it, and everybody just assumed that this was the production function. Then after the innovation, people now know that, that this is the production function. And this might be a way of of modeling entrepreneurship, but it certainly doesn't model it as a simple kind of input into a production function. Okay, that's all I'm going to say in general about production function. In the next lesson, we are going to forget about all these caveats, assume that the production function is complete, and show how to graph it.